If I could have the lights down, please. The session is going to start in, uh, in about a minute and a half. I have uh, more notes from Sandra that I want to let the, uh, let the members uh, uh, make them aware of while everybody is filtering in. Probably first and foremost is that we will be using the poll everywhere and right there on both screens. If you would go ahead and download that to your mobile device, the number is right there. I will need to read that for you. We'll be using that for this session, the World uh, Vision session, and we'll be using this also the poll everywhere for this afternoon's Diagnostic Cytology Seminar. So please go ahead and download this app to your mobile device. Another reminder, Dr. Vivian Weiss, who was not able to be with us uh, on Thursday, uh, we are setting up a Skype session. So this afternoon's session will start at 2.15. She will give a 15-minute dissertation on her Shark Tank work that she did, and the Diagnostic Cytology Seminar will begin right after that. Your booklet has a Catherine Smith listed as one of the panelists for the Diagnostic Cytology Seminar. Miss Smith could not be with us, so she's been replaced by another Smith, and that will be uh, Miss Michelle Smith from the University of Wisconsin. And she will, we thank her for stepping in at the last minute for being a panelist for the Diagnostic Cytology Seminar. If you still need a ticket for tonight's foundation gala, I have been told by Sandra, you are out of luck. It is uh, sold out. On the other hand, if there are individuals who have tickets and realize they cannot make it, you may want to put a message on the message board and you can check the message board if there are any tickets available for this evening's foundation gala. <clears throat> um, tomorrow morning's breakfast and beverage break will be located in the Grand Salon Ballroom, which is over here on this side instead of the exhibit hall where you were this morning. Um, don't forget to complete your evaluations and your SAMS questions at your earliest opportunity. And I've also been reminded to mention to you that bidding on the Art for Adv Advocacy list ends at 9 p.m., tonight, so please, if you are highly interested, put your bid down, but you've got to get it in there before 9 o'clock this evening. And it is exactly 11.02. I have took two minutes more than I should have. I apologize. So, Dr. Barkan, the session is yours. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, this works. Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the World Vision Session. We are so excited to have all of you guys here today. And do we have a treat for you. So you may be wondering, like, what is this World Vision about? How did we come up with this idea? Uh, and let me tell you about this. So it actually came from the Eurovision Song Contest. So those of you maybe from Europe might know about it. But those of us in the US know the um, game shows like Dancing with the Stars or America's Got Talent. Well, the world's got cytology talent. <laughs> so that's what we're going to uh, showcase you. We have five very bright young individuals showing uh, different cases in their, from their institutions. And we have a fabulous jury who's going to be doing this. Uh, but back to the Eurovision, when it came up in the 1950s, the idea was to bring Europe together, a war-torn Europe together. Uh, although they had difference in opinions and whatnot, it was the idea with the uh, use of art at that time to bring everybody together. And that is our goal, to bring the world together using cytology. And with that, we are actually doing live video casting for the first time in the ASC history, which is really fabulous because anywhere in the world, um, they could be watching this and uh, seeing what we are doing here at the ASC. Uh, so uh, a couple of other things I wanted to say is uh, the idea actually came up from Dr. Rossi here. Uh, we happened to be watching the Eurovision Song Contest simultaneously, she in Italy and me in uh, Chicago. And she says, well, why don't we do this? And I thought that was a great, fabulous idea, and she ran along with it. So with that, uh, Dr. Rossi and I would like to thank a bunch of individuals. One, Dr. Ali uh, and the executive board for listening to us and making this a reality. Uh, two, uh, for Dr. Wakeley and the Scientific Program Committee for allowing us 90 minutes so we could do this. Uh, Dr. Maureen Zokowski with her generous uh, 
donation so we can actually make this happen. Ms. Beth Jenkins, who was a fabulous person in the AIC and made sure it was organized and went through very nicely. Dr. Kristen Atkins in the audience here, who helped me with the improv sessions and making sure everybody was ready to talk and take this on. Uh, and uh, of course, our um, applicants who sent in their applications, um, our wonderful, fabulous jury that you're going to see in a minute, um, our uh, five finalists who we can't wait to listen to, and the one and only Dr. Laurent Pantonowicz, who is going to be moderating this awesome session. So sit back, relax, and have fun. So, hello everyone. I'm Liron Pantanoas, also known as the Ryan Secrets of Cytology, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, this is fantastic, um, you know, having, you know, grown up in South Africa and come to the U.S., I uh, couldn't support an event like this more. Uh, as you can see, we have contestants from all around the world. Our jury come from all around the world, so we're super excited. Now, uh, you see four members of the jury up there, but there are actually five, and you're the fifth member of the jury today. So, as Dr. Wakeley said, please make sure you're ready with your phone so you can text, because your vote's going to count uh, for, you know, the best contestant out there. So the way this will work is basically uh, con each contestant will come up, present their case, um, and then they will be exposed to our friendly jury who will question them and uh, you know we will then move on through all five contestants. There's a scoring system pretty much like the Shark Tank before. The, the, the jurors have all uh, you know looked at those judging criteria it's a very fair system, uh, no bias uh, involved. Uh, we've tried not to mix and match uh, countries unfairly, um, and uh, that's why we need your vote. And then we will, at the end, present the award. Uh, but you know, we will say everyone is a winner, bringing the cytology community together. So I'd like to introduce our prestigious jury to you, and they probably need no introduction, um, our first juror is, uh, you know, Dr. Ritu Nayu from Northwestern. Um, I think we all know how amazing she is. I'd like to just share one or two things with you. I don't know if all of you know she's a military brat. Her dad was in the uh, military. And uh, her word of wisdom to us is, please follow your heart and your gut and give it your best. And I think our contestants are here to do that. Welcome, Dr. Nayu. Next, we're honored to have Dr. Shishandraya, all the way from London, from Guys and Thomas' Hospital. I uh, hope you got your French uh, toast here. <laughs> okay, because uh, he told us he loves French toast, uh, so we hope he got that. And his words of wisdom to us are as follows. Cytology is not about cells, rather it's about the person from whom those cells come from. So thank you for joining us and accepting uh, to be one of our jury members. And again, we're honored all the way from Brazil to have Dr. Mauro Seg. Mauro, uh, he should actually be up here. He was an amateur actor, uh, you know, professional almost. Uh, I'm just winging it up here. <laughs> and, you know, if you read Mauro's words of wisdom, which is he's totally excited and supportive of this current era of globalization where technology and its stuff has brought us all together. And, this particular world vision exactly, uh, uh, you know, uh, measures exactly what you have, uh, you know, uh, had put forward. So thank you, uh, Mara, for coming all the way from Brazil to participate. <laughs> and last but not least, we have all the way from Rome in Italy, Dr. Diana Rossi, uh, you know, who, who writes in her spare time, because she would really, if she could go back in a time machine, would go back to the Renaissance, and be a poet in Italy. Uh, so uh, welcome, and her message to us is work hard, follow your passion and enthusiasm, and be down to earth. And so we've met some of these contestants, and I think you all measure up to that. So welcome to the US to participate. So, and you don't forget, you're the fifth jury member. So we really want your, your, your polls, uh, we want to poll you, and we really like you to participate. So I'd like to introduce to you our five 
amazing contestants. And they come from five different countries, of course. We do have uh, one uh, member who uh, is from the US, but let's meet them one by one. So the first is Ingrid, Dr. Penshorn, uh, who joins us all the way from Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Ingrid Pinzon is a third-year resident in anatomical pathology at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. After completing her medical training, she worked in primary health and psychiatry. In 2015, she was awarded the prestigious Lori Dipinar Scholarship, enabling her to undertake a master's degree in neuroscience at King's College London. It was her experience in a neuroscience laboratory that ignited her love for cyto and histopathology, and upon returning to South Africa, she enrolled in anatomical pathology. She is passionate about her hometown, Cape Town, a city known for its vibrant culture, spectacular beaches, and the iconic Table Mountain. Free time is spent hiking or occasionally disappearing down a YouTube rabbit hole. She is also an award-winning playwright and published poet. Ingrid is employed by the National Health Laboratory Service, the sole provider of diagnostic pathology services to the South African public health system, which serves the vast majority of citizens. South Africa has the fourth highest worldwide prevalence of HIV and AIDS, translating to Kaposi sarcoma, myobacterium tuberculosis infection, and HIV-related nephropathy being commonplace diagnoses in anatomical pathology. South Africa has been a democratic republic since 1994, when Nelson Mandela became president. Despite ongoing challenges like unemployment and corruption, South Africans are an optimistic people, bound together by Ubuntu, I am because you are. So Ingrid, come on up, Thanks. meet the jury and meet the audience. Thank you. <laughs> Push that button, so. Thank you. Goedemorgen. Uh, Good morning. Molweni. Um, before I start, just a huge thanks to the AAC for providing the five of us with this incredible opportunity. Thank you very much. All right, so let's get stuck in. Um, oops, next. Oops. Okay. All right. So this case started when a young man, a teenager, presented to our F&A clinic. Uh, he'd been referred from a peripheral primary health facility because of this large lump he had in the right side of his neck. He also had complaints of headaches, he'd had blurry vision, and he'd had numerous episodes of nausea and vomiting. We proceeded to aspirate the lesion, which clinically was in keeping with an enlarged a level 5A cervical lymph node. We obtained quite uh, cellular smears, comprising uh, dispersed single cells, as well as cellular aggregates. Background lymphocytes were sparse. The cells were intermediate in size, with round to oval nuclei, um, quite pleomorphic nuclei. Uh, the cytoplasm, as you can see, was scant. The chromatin was finely granular. Uh, nucleoli were small to inconspicuous, and you can appreciate some chromatin smearing on this slide. Um, in some areas, there was quite prominent nuclear molding, and we found one or two of these little structures uh, thinking are they little uh, follicles or ductules or perhaps rosettes? We weren't quite sure at the time. So at this stage, with very limited clinical information, we were sitting with a really wide differential diagnosis. So first on our list were metastatic small round blue cell tumors. So we considered a rhabdomyosarcoma. Although we didn't have any uh, evidence of skeletal muscle differentiation, we were thinking of a Ewing sarcoma. 
Uh, although we didn't have the classic light and dark cell population that's described, we didn't have a tigroid background. Uh, the patient was definitely of the right age and sex for a desmoplastic small round cell tumor. Sorry. Um, and we know that the desmoplastic component often doesn't aspirate, so it could just look like small round blue cells. And then we considered an olfactory neuroblastoma. Um, seeing that the cells really had a kind of neuroendocrine, neuroblastic morphology, we didn't have any neuropil to support the diagnosis, but we did have that one rosette-like structure, so we were hoping for this. And then on morphology, the same basically goes for neuroblastoma. Uh, we know that cases are described in older patients, and in the site, in the neck, it might even be a primary tumor, not necessarily a metastasis. And then the patient was probably a bit young, but we did keep in the back of our mind a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, this is an example of a small cell, and you can see it looks pretty much the same as what we had on our slides. And then lastly, we were considering some cyanonasal carcinomas. In this age group specifically, perhaps a nut carcinoma. Although we didn't have foci of abrupt keratinization, which would have been nice to support the diagnosis. So at this stage, it was really time to narrow it down. And we proceeded to uh, perform some immunohistochemistry on our cell block. And these were the four positive stains we got. So we got nice strong staining with synaptophysin and CD56. We also had some positive staining with neurofilament between the tumor cells, and we had positive nuclear staining with TTF1. This is just a summary of the big panel of stains that we did, and you can see from all the negative stains that we eliminated quite a few of the contenders on our list, leaving us with either an olfactory neuroblastoma, a neuroblastoma, or neuroendocrine carcinoma, although the positive neurofilament staining pretty much eliminated neuroendocrine. So at this stage, we had to sign out a report. And we call it a metastatic neuroblastic neoplasm, and in view of the clinical parameters, we favored an olfactory neuroblastoma. So olfactory neuroblastoma is also known as esthesia neuroblastoma. It's a malignant neuroectodermal tumor with neuroblastic differentiation, and it's thought to arise from the olfactory placode. So clinically, cases have been described in patients as young as two years old up to 90 years old. Um, there's a slight male predominance, and the, uh, the tumor characteristically has to involve the cribriform plate. On the histomorphology, it's a small round blue cell tumor with a lobular growth pattern. And depending on the degree of differentiation, you can have some neuropil, perhaps some rosettes. And the Hyams grading system is used. And quite interesting that the grading of the tumor actually seems to be a more accurate prognostic tool in this tumor than the staging, the pathologic and clinical staging. So on immunohistochemistry, our markers for neuroblastic differentiation will be positive. Um, and you can have neurofilament highlighting your neuropil. You can get S100 positive sustentacular cells. And more recently described is TTF1 positivity in olfactory neuroblastoma. And PAX5 um, has been shown to possibly be um, indicative of a more aggressive behavior in these tumors. So back to our patient, he was referred to our ear, nose, and throat clinic, where they uh, discovered a large tumor in the superior nasal cavity with involvement of the cribriform plate. A subsequent MRI um, showed that the tumor had unfortunately already invaded the frontal cortex. So the neurosurgeons supplied us with a nice biopsy, and we were able to confirm a diagnosis of olfactory neuroblastoma. Uh, the tumor was very poorly differentiated. As you can appreciate, it was graded as a grade four. Um, unfortunately, due to the advanced uh, stage of the patient's disease, he received mainly palliative treatment, and he passed away nine months after the initial diagnosis. 
So I would just like to end off with uh, five learning points that I extrapolated from the case for myself and that I would just like to share with you. So first up is just um, to know that in resource poor settings, uh, patients with metastatic malignancies will often have access to a, a kind of a simple test like an F and A long before they get seen at a specialist clinic or before they undergo any other uh, fancy uh, imaging studies, etc. So in the absence of um, appropriate clinical information and imaging studies, you as a pathologist can often end up with a very wide differential diagnosis uh, from your F and A. Um, requiring extensive ancillary tests like immunohistochemistry or even molecular studies to come up with a diagnosis. Therefore, just a reminder for all of us who do aspirates to always collect extra material to make a cell block. And then just a very basic thing, but always to remember that you're not just looking at cells, but that the cells come from someone. So remember the clinical um, context. Um, in this case, even though the patient had clear symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, we know that it would be highly unusual for a primary CNS malignancy to metastasize to a cervical lymph node. We therefore favored a sinonasal tumor with secondary um, extension into the cranial fossa. And then when you are dealing with a small round blue cell tumor, it's important to know that your um, secondary morphological features like skeletal muscle differentiation, ganglion cells, neuropil, uh, can often be sparse or even completely absent at the metastatic site. And this is often um, determined by the degree of differentiation in your primary tumor. And then to end off with, just a reminder for us as pathologists to really work hard at establishing and maintaining our relationships with our clinical colleagues. So in this case, we were able to really expedite this patient's visit to get into a specialist clinic um, because of existing good communication channels. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed it. I thought you did an awesome job. I love the South African accent. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, I'm going to open it up to the jury. So jury, it's all up to you to ask uh, you know, uh, your questions to Dr. Penzorn. Okay. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for your case. Very interesting case. Uh, you described different uh, features, uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, just going back to your uh, take on messages and also the morphological features, what do you think is the most uh, specific and most important uh, morphological features in order, you know, to suggest and to think this, uh, of this diagnosis? And the amount, the five is two questions, so, and the amount of different take on messages, which is the most important for us, for all of us? Um, can, I, can I answer your second question yes. first? <laughs> uh, I think just, so the whole, it's difficult to say. So, so part of me wants to say to always remember the clinical context where your case comes from. And then also what I was saying about having uh, good communication with uh, clinicians. Because in our setting, we often get forms that are very incompletely uh, filled in. I mean, I do many of the aspirates. I don't know who's the doctor who sent this patient. I don't know who's gonna see him again at his clinic. It's often very difficult. It's not a good, we don't have a good infrastructure with like contacts. So I think that's so important with like an urgent case like this. Um, it's not just an aspirate of an epidermoid cyst um, that you really can, uh, yeah, that you know your clinicians or try to, yeah, really f for the patient's benefit to, to let them not get lost to follow up. Um, and then your first question, if I understand correctly, you were asking about morphological features that's important for olfactory neuroblastoma. Um, yeah, so I think that the problem with this case was that we didn't have a well-differentiated tumor. So it's basically a small round blue cell tumor, but with, I would call it neuroendocrine kind of features. So if you see those kind of those chromatin features, the molding and those things to also think of, of a neuroblastic lesion. Um, and then if you have a better differentiated one and you have nice neuropil and um, rosettes, then obviously your other thought would be a neuroblastoma, but depending on the site, um, I think those would be your most um, your pertinent features. Okay. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the next contestant comes to us all the way from Naples, Italy, Elena Verglier. I hope I got that right. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Elena and uh, Naples to you. Dr. Elena Vigliar is a cytopathologist and research fellow of University of Naples Frederico II, Italy. The Italian peninsula is nicknamed the boot due to its peculiar shape. The whole country contains some of the most different natural beauties on earth and an amazing historic artistic heritage. Notably, Naples is so fascinating that the poet Goeth wrote See Naples and then died to pay homage to the spectacular city. In Italy, health is enshrined as a fundamental right. National Health Service was established to grant universal access to a uniform level of care throughout the country, financed by general taxation and inexpensive patients' co-pay fee. The combination of health care, teaching, and research occurs in the university hospitals, such as the University of Naples, where Dr. Vigliar works. Under the guidance of Chief of the Department of Public Health, Professor Giancarlo Troncone, a large team cooperates in the Cytopathology and Predictive Molecular Biology Service, in which cytopathologists perform U.S.-guided FNA by themselves and manage diagnostic material for molecular testing. Beyond the work, Dr. Vigliar cultivates a passion for her husband's work, beekeeping for honey production. Fine needles or bee stings, they are still punctures. Elena, come and join us on the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, the presentation and uh, this opportunity. And um, today I uh, would like to share with you a challenging cytological diagnosis of a 51 years old woman. The history starts in 2015 when the patient underwent the breast cosmetic augmentation with the textured surface implant. And three years later, she developed a left per implant effusion, cytologically evaluated at another institution as a non-specific inflammatory reaction. And in April 2019, the patient came to our institution for a persistent breast swelling and uh, an ultrasound confirmed the presence of a scant per implant effusion, so we performed an ultrasound guided fin needle aspiration. And we collected 60 milliliters of cloud jellowish fluid, and the cytospins were prepared for Papa Nicolaou staining, and the cell block was prepared from residual material. Uh, cytospins show a deny cellular samples with the uh, scant small lymphocytes in the background and the dispersed population of uh, medium to large side cells with the scant but evident cytoplasm, hyperchromatic nuclei, and sometimes peripherally located. And uh, even the cell blocks show a deny cellularity, and uh, on eye magnification we uh, can appreciate three different populations a uh, cell population of medium-sized cells with very regular nuclei, a population of larger cells with the kidney-shaped nuclei and uh, abundant clear cytoplasm, and multinucleated cells. Moreover, scattered atypical metotic figures were observed. At this point, we evaluated the different um, the differential diagnosis, and we considered both benign reactive condition, taking into account the clinical findings, and the uncommon presentation of neoplastic condition, taking into account the morphological features. As far as benign condition, uh, acute reactive seroma is, um, it is mostly relate, um, related to infection, and uh, as opposite to our case that we can, uh, um, is on the left, um, acute reactive seroma is uh, characterized by a prominent neutrophilic inf uh, infiltration with uh, some macrophages. 
Instead, when the implant ruptures occur, a foreign body, re body reaction is observed with the foamy macrophages and multinucleated giant cells. On the other hand, uh, for neoplastic condition in breast carcinoma, cytological samples are generally characterized by three-dimensional or loosely aggregated groups of epithelial cells positive for uh, mammary epithelial markers, such as estrogen receptor. Less frequent uh, breast malignancy are lymphomas, and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common histotype. And uh, as in our case, um, cytological samples are composed of a dispersed uh, cell po population uh, with uh, uh, large nuclei, regular nuclei, which may be cleaved with more on, uh, on, or more uh, prominent nucleoli, and the neoplastic cells show the CD20 positivity. Lastly, anaplastic large cell lymphoma should be considered. In fact, as in our case, this lymphoma is cytological composed of a dispersed population of large cells with kidney-shaped nuclei. CD30 is positive and ALK1 may be positive or negative. Uh, at this point, we completely ruled out benign reactive condition and we focus our attention on the neoplastic condition. And in order to differentiate between these entities, we performed an immunohistochemical study. Pancytokeratin was completely negative, as well as the CD68 and the CD20 with internal positive controls. CD3 was diffusely positive, as well as CD30, even in larger cells with kidney-shaped nuclei. ALK1 was completely negative, and more than 80% of cells showed the positivity for uh, Ki67. At this point, uh, the diagnosis of malignancy was evident. And uh, in our clinical practice, we diagnose breast cancer every day, above all carcinoma, since always. And uh, I'm showing, uh, showing uh, you uh, uh, one of the earliest pictorial representation of breast cancer. In fact, the painting represents a left breast uh, malignant lesion with the nipple retraction. And uh, our patient has a breast malignancy too, but her disease was uh, for sure non-existent at the time because our diagnosis was breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma, BLCL. BLCL is a T-cell lymphoma recently added to the WHO classification, and uh, to date, uh, around 600 cases have been reported worldwide. The most common presentation is a large spontaneous periprosthetic fluid collection occurring at, la at least one year following cosmetic or reconstructive implantation and the less frequently patient will, preside, will present with palpable mass or lymphadenopathy. BLCL is exclusively related to textured surface breast implant, and the etiopathogenesis is uh, unclear, maybe multifactorial, and involve a, a, involve a chronic immune activation. And uh, as oncogenetic event, you can see in the red box, mutation in the JAKSTAT pathway have been reported, but in view of a small number of cases, further studies are needed for a comprehensive molecular characterization. We know that non-Hodgkin lymphoma are traditionally uh, staged using the Unarbor system, but uh, taking into account the clinical progression of BLCL with possible infiltration of the capsule and beyond the capsule, behavior is best predicted using a staging system for solid tumor, the TNM, and uh, up to 80% of patients have an early stage of disease. And uh, in these patients, uh, an in-block resection of capsule and implants is associated with an excellent outcome. And uh, taking into account the clinical presentation of BLCL as a seroma, we know that fine needle aspiration is an optimal method to sample breast seroma. In fact, fine needle aspiration is recommended in the, uh, in the initial workup of any perimplant effusion in the recent update of the NCCN guideline for BLCL diagnosis. But I would like to draw your attention to the specification below. 
if possible, obtain more than 50 milliliters of, uh, of fluid for cytology and cell block. And if you remember, we collected only six milliliters of fluid. <coughs> this means that the proper management of cytological material has allows to obtain a definitive diagnosis even when scant material is collected. So back to our patient at the preoperative PET MRI, uh, no areas of abnormal enhancement were detected in breast uh, or in axillary lymph node. So the patient underwent an in-block resection of implant and capsule. And histological control confirms the cytological diagnosis of BLCL. And to date, the patient is alive and this is free. And the case has been reported to the Italian Ministry of Health that set up a registry for BLCL diagnosis similar to the, um, so, sorry, similar to the uh, red profile registry in the US. So uh, in conclusion, in this presentation, we have seen that BLCL is a rare, maybe underestimated non-Hodgkin lymphoma presenting as a late seroma. And we know that uh, FNA is a gold standard to simple breast seroma. Therefore, cytopathologists need to be aware of BLCL morphological and immunophenotypical findings. And finally, an appropriate management of cytological samples allows to obtain a definitive diagnosis even in scant per-implant seroma. But if you have time, there is a last point because I told you this is story uh, as a pathologist, but this experience has uh, another point of view, that of the patient. In fact, uh, BLCL is a, a new disease, but has generated an enormous media resonance. France has been the first uh, European country to ban um, breast tax red uh, implants, followed by Australia and uh, USA, uh, where the FDA has requested in August a recall for a, a tax red surface implant. In Italy, this has not happened, and uh, in May, there was the first case of an Italian woman who died of uh, BLCL. And if you remember, our uh, patient's history starts in April, so we needed to deal with the patient's concern. And so, this is the point. I think that uh, cytop as a cytopathologist and interventional cytopathologist, communication is part of our work, and I am happy to say that today I'm still in contact with my patient. And now, thank you, grazie, in Italian, for your attention, and uh, special thanks to my mentor, Professor Troncone, and these groups. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, you did a great job. Those pictures were beautiful, I hope you agree with me. I liked uh, in, the, in the introduction when there was the story about the poet who said, you know, once you've been to Naples, uh, you know, you can die. <laughs> I, I've been to Naples, I think what he meant to say is the pizza there is to die for. <laughs> yeah. All right, so at this point, I'd like to ask our uh, jurors, uh, you know, please go ahead and ask uh, Elena some questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, very good presentation. Um, regarding, you've uh, told us a little bit about the pathophysiology, and uh, there are some, many theories out there. There was even recently a published case of a buttock associated lymphoma, uh, not only breast. So there seems to be associated to implants everywhere. So I was just wondering, uh, knowing that and about the pathophysiology of the, of the onset of these lymphomas, what do you think it would be an acceptable or an idea of approaching these patients in terms of screening or preventing the onset of these lymphomas? Yes, uh, mm, thank you for the question. But the, the etiopathogenesis in pathophysiology is multifactorial, complex, maybe related to toxin re, uh, released from the implants and the bacterial biofilms. Uh, the, import, the, the, the best approach to this patient is a follow-up. There is not a uh, need to remove implants in this patient. It's sufficient a follow-up and the cytological evaluation of any implant effusion. So uh, I think this is the best approach to this patient. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
you. So our next contestant also comes from Europe. Uh, Sarah Damata comes to us all the way from Portugal, and let's watch her video introduction. In the southwest corner of Europe, facing the Atlantic Ocean, lies one of its oldest nations, Portugal. Dr. Damata is one of the lucky 11 million people who live in this sunbathed country made of vineyards, mountains, rivers, beaches, and paradisiac islands. Portugal was once regarded as one of the world's major economic, political, and military powers, with an empire stretching through four continents. Its history provided us with an inspiring cultural heritage which can be admired in street tiles, cathedrals, and elegant palaces, heard in Fado, tasted in pastis de nada and codfish dishes, and toasted to our fragrant wines. We are a democratic, developed, and peaceful country where citizens have access to essentially free education and health care. Sarah de Mata is a resident in pathology working in Lisbon, the capital. Besides the everyday work in the Oncologic Institute and keen interest in cytology and gastrointestinal pathology, Dr. Damata is also an enthusiastic traveler, foodie, and impressionist lover. Sarah, come and join us up on the stage. Thank you very much. I'll try to keep up with the rest of the participants. <laughs> so my name is Sara Mata and I'm a pathology resident in Portugal. I have no conflicts of interest to declare and these two entities sponsored my coming here. Our case concerns a six-year-old man from Porto with chronic lymphocytic leukemia diagnosed in 2011 <laughs> and treated with chemotherapy the, the following year due to thrombocytopenia. During his follow-up, two years later, he presented with a cervical mass. Here we can see the cervical mass that has 12 centimeters and was described as a conglomerate. A fine needle biopsy was performed and here we have a low magnification of a cellular smear. On higher magnification, we can see that the smear is evenly hypercellular and composed of discohesive round cells. These cells are small, have scant cytoplasm, the nuclei are regular, inconspicuous nucleoli, and have clumped chromatin reminiscent of a soccer ball. Scattered in the background of these small cells, we can see here three larger atypical cells. On the right, a mononucleated cell. On the left, a binucleated cell. And on the center, we have a trilobulated cell with macronucleoli. Here again, we can see the, the background of small cells. The larger typical cells appreciate the nuclei in moderate amounts of cytoplasm, and we can see uh, lots of lymphoglandular bodies. So we have smears of monotonous small lymphocytes with a soccer uh, ball pattern of chromatin that is in keeping with CLL, but who are these large cells? Our differential diagnosis included Hictus syndrome, CLL with Reed Stenberg cells, CLL with large proliferation centers, or a secondary malignancy. Rictus syndrome is the occurrence of a high grade, more aggressive lymphoma in a patient who has CLL, and this happens in about 2 to 10 percent of the cases. Generally, it happens to diffuse large B cell lymphoma. We have on the, uh, on the image on the left a diffuse large B cell lymphoma composed of discohesive large cells with moderate amount of cytoplasm and a preeminent nucleoli. This is completely different from our case. We have a small background. Uh, small cell background with large scattered cells. However, Richter syndrome does not happen only to diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Sometimes in 10% of the cases of Richter syndrome, the high grade lymphoma will be a Hodgkin lymphoma. On the image on the left, we have a, a small a background of small lymphocytes 
The, the, big, the large cell on the left is a typical mononucleated Hodgkin cell. On the right, there is a typical reed Sternberg cell with a uh, multilobulated nuclei and macronucleoli, which is quite similar to our case. We also have a background of small cells and a larger typical cell that is quite similar. However, as we've seen, our small cells are in keeping with the CLL. They have a background of a clumped chromatin and not the typical background of a Hodgkin lymphoma. And to make a diagnosis of a Hodgkin lymphoma type of Richter syndrome, we do need a reactive background. So maybe we do have Reed Stenberg cells, but they are in a background of CLL and not in a reactive background. In that case, we would have a CLL with Reed Stenberg like cells. And these Reed Stenberg like cells are described in CLL. They can happen in a straightforward CLL uh, without being in a progression. They can be morphological identical and they can co express CD30 and CD15. However, this patient has a CLL. We already knew he had a CLL. He has a bulky cervical disease, and this could be just bulky CLL, CLL with large proliferation centers. The proliferation centers are the proliferating part of CLL, and they are made, as we can see on the left, on the image on the left, of small lymphocytes and larger lymphocytes. These larger lymphocytes are called perimmunoblasts and prolymphocytes. So, do we have perimmunoblasts and prolymphocytes? Actually, our cells are much bigger. They have multilobulation and they have macronucleoli. The nucleoli is much bigger, it's reddish, and the cells do not have this regular contour as the prolymphocytes and perimmunoblasts. Um, this could also be a secondary malignancy. We know that CLL is an indolent disease and these patients may have metastasis from other uh, malignancies and this could justify the clinical picture. But what about the cytology? Non-nematological met uh, metastases like uh, melanoma or nasopharyngeal carcinoma may have a typical large cells like our cells and they might be scarce. So we did some uh, immunocytochemistry to sort this out, and our small lymphocytes were CD20 positive, they were CD3 positive, CD5 positive, and they were cyclin D1 negative, so we do have CLL in the background. The larger cells were PAX5 positive, weaker than the small cells, they were CD30 positive and CD15 positive, and they were CD20 negative. So this is suggestive of Reed Stenberg cells. On flow cytometry, 99% of our sample was composed of lymphocytes. 86% were small lymphocytes with a phenotype typical of CLL. We did genetic tests and we found alterations that are typical found in CLL, like a deletion of uh, the 13 key 14, uh, but they were not further contributive for the diagnosis. So we ruled out the CLL with large proliferation centers and the secondary malignancy. And our diagnosis on cytology was chronic lymphocytic leukemia with Reed Stenberg cells. And this can either be a classical Hodgkin lymphoma type of Richter syndrome or a chronic lymphocytic leukemia with Reed Stenberg like cells. A biopsy was performed, and here we can see two different areas. The one on the top that is bluish and composed of small lymphocytes, typical of CLL, and the one on the bottom that, that is more eosinophilic and composed of histiocytes, plasma cells, and lymphocytes. And um, on the bottom right, we can see on the center a Reed Stenberg cell. The area on the top was typical CLL with small lymphocytes that were CD3 negative, CD20 positive, and had almost no CD30 positive large cell. And the area on the bottom was typical for Hodgkin lymphoma with lots of small CD3 positive cells, um, and the large cells were CD20 negative and CD30 positive, in keeping with a Reed Stenberg cell. So the final diagnosis was classical Hodgkin lymphoma Richter syndrome. This is a rare event. It happens in less than 1% of CLL uh, patients, um, more or less four years after the initial diagnosis, and the median survival is short, four to 40 months. Um, around half percent of the cases are clonally related. 
And going back to, to our patient, he did chemotherapy, consolidated with bone marrow transplant in, in, uh, up until 2015 with good response, and he's now asymptomatic without uh, further disease. So, in conclusion, Richter syndrome is the occurrence of a more aggressive uh, lymphoma in a CLL patient. It doesn't have to be always DLBCL. In CLL patients with, with an abrupt clinical deterioration, the finding of isolated large cells with macronucleoli should always prompt the, the possibility of a Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin with Stenberg cells can either be found in a straightforward CLL uh, disease and doesn't have to be transformation, or it can be a Hodgkin lymphoma type of Richter syndrome. In that case, we need an inflammatory reactive background. Um, and given that Richter syndrome dramatically changes the course of CLL, it requires urgent um, recognition and treatment. We should all know about it. I have to thank Dr. Elena Bohoka, who shared this case with me, and that is the, the specialist responsible for this case, and Daniel Mello, who is my colleague and also responsible for the, the case, and who uh, wanted to share with you. And thank you so much also for letting me be here. So thank you, Sarah, for sharing that amazing, interesting case makes me nervous. I better go back and screen my, my CLLs a little closer and make sure everyone else in the lab screens our CLLs a little bit closer. So I'm going to ask the jury if you could ask uh, you know, your questions. Yes. Um, hi, Sarah. That was a wonderful uh, case that you showed us, as Liron said. And I particularly appreciated how you took us through your thought process. It was very nicely done. And like Liron, I think it's, it's really a wide spectrum. And you, have, you worked it up very well. You had a great... Uh, uh, panel that you did, both with FLOW as well as with IHC. Uh, so I noted that your patient had had uh, flodarabin, and uh, there's been some reports of uh, EBV being associated uh, uh, as a finding in patients who, with CLL who'd received this type of therapy and has been postulated as perhaps causing immune suppression. But obviously there's a, a wide spectrum of differential diagnostic considerations here. So could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you uh, have read about what might be the hypotheses of these various types of uh, changes that can occur in uh, the Richter's transformation? Yeah, um, actually with fludarabine, and our patient has been treated with fludarabine, uh, some papers say that uh, with fludarabine we have a immunodeficiency uh, of T cells and that may react, uh, uh, they may react with EBV, but our case was actually EBV negative, so I didn't uh, uh, talk about it. Uh, but yeah, that, that could be a way, but uh, there are lots of Richter uh, syndrome, um, uh, Hodgkin type lymphomas that have not been treated with fludarabine. Some are EBV negative like mine, um, and some are actually not even clonally related to the CLL. Uh, actually, uh, we are going to do a left one because left one uh, stains on CLLs and we would like to see if this is clonally related. We do not, maybe if uh, our, our Reed Stenberg cells stain with, uh, Reed, with uh, uh, left one, it may, might be uh, clonally related and we would like to know if our good prognosis, because it has passed four years and he's alive, and we would like to know if it's like a de novo um, Hodgkin lymphoma composed with the, lymph with the CLL there, and that's why it's so good. Or it is really a transformation that is going well. We'd like to further study that. I don't think there are studies enough to know the etiology and the correspondence with the prognosis. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Thank you. So our next contestant, all the way from Thailand, is uh, Dr. Supersan uh, Sripodo. And uh, let's uh, see the video from Thailand. Oh. oh, video is missing. Could AV uh, play the video for us? There we go.
Supasant Sipodak is a junior pathologist who has just completed his training from the Faculty of Medicine in Ramatibodi Hospital, Mahidol University. Prior to the achievement, he obtained Doctor of Medicine from the Faculty of Medicine in Vajira Hospital, Navamindra Tirak University. Supasan has fallen in love with pathology since he was a medical student. He is interested in cytopathology and dermatopathology. He currently lives in Bangkok, Thailand, where he was born and raised. Known as the Land of Smile, Thailand is famous for its delicious delicacies, majestic temples, and beautiful natural attractions. In addition to those, the Thais are known to be humble, respectful, and welcoming to the diversities and differences of the visiting travelers. It is no wonder that Thailand has become one of the most visited destinations for tourists from around the world. One of the outstanding healthcare policies in Thailand is the universal coverage for every Thai resident. This policy has made it possible for a lot of the low-income Thais, especially those living in the rural area, to access the medical services for more than 10 years. Presently, by governmental policy, we are expecting to become a medical hub of Aishan in the near future. Come on up and join us. Thank you for having me being here. Uh, this is my first time presenting in English also, and I hope you guys uh, can understand me. Okay, okay, and okay, let's start with the case. This is a case of a, a Thai boy who have a mandibular mass. Okay, next, please. Uh, oops. I have, okay, I don't have any conflict of interest to declare here. Okay, let's start with the clinical history. Okay, this is a uh, 14 years old Thai boy who was referred from the peripheral hospital with a clinical history of the right mandibular mass and uh, he has lost his weight for about six kilograms in the one month. On the physical examination, uh, there is a firm to heart mass at the right side of mandible. And there is no other so-called lymphadenopathy is noted on the invest, uh, his blood examination. There is just only a few leukocytosis with no neutrophilic predominant and just my hypercalcemia. This is the picture of the imaging study. On the, your left side is a plain film and on the right side is a CT scan. And you can see that there is a expansive mass with a uh, aggressive behavior at his right side mandible, okay? With this uh, finding, the radiologist think that it may be a metastasis or just a primary bone lesion or just a hematologic malignancy with, because of his age. The, the other uh, metastasis is not quite uh, common. Okay, then we got a FNA from, uh, from the ENT doctor and we got only like a four smear slide, that's it, and we don't have any opportunity to do the cell block or other taste. Okay, let's see. In, on the lower magnification, we can see that it, the, the smear we got is uh, quite uh, cellular and it's adequate for us to interpret them, but a little bit of drying artifact. On higher magnification, we can see the detail more uh, that the cell contain a uh, quite monotonous looking uh, with uh, some degree of crushing artifact at the peripheral area. And maybe on the upper hand side, we can see like a, uh, this one, like a, Mitosis, yeah, okay. On higher magnification, when we look closely, uh, the, the cell contain abundant cytoplasm and round to oval shaped nuclei with vesicular nuclei and some contain like a hyperchromatin and like a inconspicuous nucleoli as well. And we also see the like a dysplastic 
this keratotic like cell in the middle with a dense uh, cytoplasm. On the, another fragment, that you, we will see that the cells uh, are quite a little bit preomorphic. Not, not that preomorphic, but just some degree of preomorphism. And there's some kind of vacuolated cytoplasm that contains like a hyperdense material, which is, we, we don't know at that point well, what is it, but oh, it just we recognize it, yeah. And uh, other areas we can see like on like the light hand side photo, you can see like there is a rosette like formation or glandular or tubular like something there, but it's, it's, it's quite weird. Like, not, not all the area contain these structures, but most of them are like a sing single cell with like a molding or something like that. At this point, we make a differential diagnosis, like just the sample of our differential diagnosis, like mucoepidermoid carcinoma because of his age. At this, he's only 14 years old, and this is quite common in the in the patient of this age, and like a squamous cell carcinoma, that we can also see that there is a keratotic cell, this keratotic cell, and Ewing sarcoma, that we can see like a rosette formation. Uh, to compare each entity, uh, we can see that for the mucoepidermoid carcinoma, we can see that uh, there's uh, quite over, over preomorphism that too much for the classic mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and we only can see the only one cell that contains like a vacuolated cytoplasm here for the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, of course, we can see the dyskeratotic cell, but the other cells that's that should that not look like the classic one that the squamous cell carcinoma should have like a dense cytoplasm, like some, some will have like a tadpole-like cell feature, something like that. But we only see only like a few area of this keratotic cell here. And uh, we just keep in mind that, oh, and plus, at this age, the patient should not have like a squamous cell carcinoma, right? But everything can happen, <laughs> okay? Okay, just keep in mind like that. And another thing that's like a Ewing sarcoma, uh, as Dr. Ingrid has proposed before, yeah, there's a, there should be like a round cell, small round blue cell with like a rosette formation. But this case, the cell that we got has too much cytoplasm, which look like a carcinoma thing more than the uric sarcoma. So at that point, uh, me and my mentor uh, discuss something, discuss about the case, and we think that we should only give the cytologic diagnosis as this malignant neoplasm of non hematologic group. And we contact to the clinician and ask them to give me further information, just like biopsy, and then we got the biopsy. And the tissue show that there is a infiltrated uh, neoplastic cell on the desmoplastic background of the soft tissue here. On higher magnification, we can see that the cells are quite monotonous looking, and like a, having a vesicular nuclei, something like that. And there is also an area of like a, the cell that contain more cytoplasm with uh, some degree of differentiation also, like a squamous, squamous looking, like that, like this that you can see in the in the right hand side. So we perform the IHC. Okay, first we do the IE1 and IE3 is totally positive and the P40 is completely positive. So this part maybe you would think like, is this a squamous cell carcinoma? But don't forget about the clinical history. Okay, and we do more the, the IHC. Uh, they are also like a focally positive for CK7. Uh, key 67 was very high, nearly 90%, 100%. And they also retain the nuclear positivity of INI1. And here's the highlight. The neoplastic cell 
uh, positive for that IHC in like a new uh, speckle nuclear positivity pattern. So uh, we also do another genetic testing for PCR and it's positive for NAT and BRD4 tran translocation. So the final diagnosis is NAT carcinoma. Let me, uh, okay, before I into, uh, start talking about NAT carcinoma, I will give you a, a in more information about our case. At the time he presented, he also complained about his uh, bony ache for, for like every part of his body. So the clinician that do the bone scan and the result is he got a widespread bony metastasis at the time of the presentation. And this is bone marrow biopsy. We also have the evidence of metastasis here. For NAT carcinoma, NAT is stand for nuclear protein in taste teeth. Formerly, we will know about the NAT midline carcinoma, but now I think we, should, uh, we omit the word midline because this, this entity can happen in every part of the body. And the most common chromosomal translocation is NAT with BRD4, BRD3, and others. Uh, it's, as I said, it can happen on the entire body, but the most common area is head and neck and thoracic area, and there is no current standard treatment here, and the clinical progression for this neoplasm is aggressive and have a poor prognosis. Back to our, our case, uh, the patient refused any further treatment after five cycles of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And there's a note on the OPD, on the medical record that he got a new lesion on his scalps. Uh, for take home message about the NAT carcinoma, uh, I would say, please keep in mind that NAT carcinoma can present at any age and uh, the morphology that you should Concern is monomorphic undifferentiated cell with a full sign of squamous differentiation. And you might requ require a genetic taste for, to confirm that di diagnosis. And also, I also found a good website that uh, I joined uh, from, from many other institutes to, to, because this is a rare entity and we are. Uh, currently studying about this entity. So this website, nmcregistry.org, uh, has uh, many cases, many publications for, for this entity. That's all uh, for my presentation, and also thank you to my mentor, my professor, and Kaufman Krab. <laughs> thank you. We understood you. We understood you very well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, well done, Super Sen. Uh, that case was nuts. I will tell you. <laughs> Fine. Uh, not only is it rare, I will tell you that you know, if I get a case and it's in the jaw, a young patient, I know I'm going to have to get textbooks out. You know, just they drive me nuts. <laughs> so, so uh, jury, please, uh, you know, feel free to ask Super Sen some questions. Thank you very much. Well done, Supasan. And as uh, Dr. Nai said, very well presented for the first time and in English. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so um, my uh, question to you is that, uh, you know, you received prepared material by the clinicians. Yes. You didn't actually have the opportunity to collect it yourself. Yeah. Um, and then eventually all the further genetic tests that you had to do relied on a biopsy. Yes. yes. Would it have been possible to perform those tests or some of the, the key tests on cytological material? Uh, I think it can be done using cyto material, but for this case, we just only the, have just only the, the, glass slides. the glass slide, yes. And, uh, and I think there's a limitation in our lab that we cannot perform the genetic testing using the glass slide. Yeah. Right, but but you you are aware that you can use the yeah. slides, the s s cell scrapings from the slides to do that. Yes. yes. And so um, w uh, I'm very pleased that you you know you excluded the differential diagnosis of uh, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma because you demonstrated keratinization in your tumor yeah. and uh, mucoepidermoid 
the carcinomas, of course, as you know, don't keratinize. Was EBV also considered as uh, one of the, you know, an undifferentiated carcinoma, nasopharyngeal type with focal keratinization? Uh, actually, in the textbook, we can, this, this entity usually happen in the sinonasal area, and we usually have to uh, do the e EBER yes. in my institute. To, 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 to exclude that, but uh, in our case, we did not use, we did not taste for EBV, yeah. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce all the way from the USA, <laughs> Dr. Dutta, and I'm sorry that they put you at the end and you know, you had to sweat it out all this time. But, uh, you know, let's watch the video and then we'll ask uh, like Nangita to come on up. Dr. Dada is a fourth year anatomic and clinical pathology resident at Henry Ford Hospital, Detroit, Michigan. She received her medical degree from Dr. MGR Medical University, India in 2005. She subsequently completed a residency in anatomy at Lady Hardinge Medical College, India in 2009. During her residency, she was involved in teaching undergraduate medical students and was much respected by the students for her knowledge and teaching style. An avid traveler, Dr. Dada has taught medical students in countries around the world, like Fiji, Aruba, and St. Lucia. She moved to the USA in 2014 to explore the opportunities in anatomic pathology and to expand her skills. Being matched at Henry Ford Hospital and trained under the strong leadership skills of Dr. Richard Zarbo is an honor and a privilege for her. Her dream is to pursue an academic career in cytopathology and surgical pathology and to be able to participate in resident education and mentorship. She strongly believes that cytopathologists are often the first responders, the first ones to alert the physician to a diagnosis of malignancy from the tiniest amount of tissue, even a few cells sometimes. To that end, she will be completing her cytopathology fellowship at Beaumont Hospital, Michigan, and a surgical pathology fellowship at Mayo Clinic, Minnesota. Dr. Dutta, come and join us up on the stage. Good morning, good afternoon, I would say. Uh, everybody, greetings from Detroit, which is freezing right now. Um, I'm so thankful and uh, honored to be here in front of such a great audience. And I'm honored that I'm uh, presenting along with the other four contestants from all around the world. I thought I traveled a lot, but I, my travel pales in comparison to how much they have traveled. Um, so today I'm here to talk about a newly described uh, entity, a newbie, uh, which came to us as a pleural fluid uh, cytology. So I'm going to talk about the uh, diagnosis. I have no conflicts of interests. So uh, the brief outline that I'll be talking about is uh, I'll give you a clinical history. Uh, we'll talk about the cytology. Uh, then we'll formulate some differential diagnosis. Uh, we did some immunohistochemical staining to rule in or rule out our differentials. Uh, then we'll talk about the final diagnosis and a brief overview of this uh, new entity. And then finally, pearls of wisdom that I uh, took away from this case. So uh, Mr. H was a 71-year-old male who presented to the Henry Ford uh, Emergency Department with acute uh, progressive shortness of breath and severe buttock pain. He was in so much pain that he had uh, difficulty in walking. Uh, his illness began about a month ago when he went to an outside hospital uh, with a lump in his left buttock. There they diagnosed him as an abscess and uh, treated him with antibiotics, which he clearly did not respond to, and that's how he ended up uh, at Henry Ford Hospital. On examination, he was in acute distress a very diaphoretic, dehydrated. He had difficulty in urination. He was constipated. Uh, there was increased respiratory effort, and there were no breath sounds over his left lung field. He also had uh, tenderness in his left perianal area. Looking at the imaging findings, there was an MRI pelvis, 
so this is a picture from the MRI pelvis, which shows an ill-defined pelvic uh, soft tissue density, which is involving his abductor and adductor uh, muscles. And it was quite substantial in size. It was 11.5 centimeter in size. And no doubt, that's why he was having those GU and uh, GI symptoms. Also, uh, a few enlarged right inguinal lymph nodes were also observed. This is the chest x-ray. And as you can see, he has a massive left-sided pleural effusion with left lung collapse. And a CT chest uh, showed multiple pleural and pulmonary nodules, which was concerning for metastatic disease. So a diagnostic and a therapeutic thoracentesis was done. And we got the pleural fluid for cytology. So what we got was 1,000 ml of turbid uh, red uh, cloudy fluid. And uh, we made uh, smears out of it and we made a cell block out of it for possible IHC staining. Uh, this is my son. He loves frogs for some reason, and he's uh, looking into it to discover something in the mouth of the frog. So let's look at the cytology of the pleural fluid. So um, on a lower magnification, uh, we can see that it's moderately cellular. There is a background of chronic inflammatory cells. But scattered in between these chronic inflammatory cells are these larger uh, cells uh, with kind of abundant granular cytoplasm. Uh, going to a higher magnification, uh, those cells look a little epithelioid with uh, dense granular cytoplasm, very reminiscent of a carcinoma or a melanoma. Uh, it has an eccentric nucleus, which is being pushed by that granular cytoplasm. This is a 600X, and we can see that uh, the nucleus is irregular, uh, and it's, again, eccentric, abundant granular cytoplasm and it has got a prominent nucleolus. This is one more cell. Some of those epithelioid cells actually showed uh, cytoplasmic inclusion. So at this point, uh, I am thinking about a rhabdoid uh, cell as well. So uh, it had these cytoplasmic uh, inclusions. There were no cross striations seen, no other features of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation like strap cells or spider cells. This was the cell block. And uh, again, a similar discohesive, monotonous population of large epithelioid cells. There is not much pleomorphism. Most of them are very uniformly sized. Eccentric nucleus, vesicular with a prominent nucleolus, and that abundant granular cytoplasm. And the arrows are denoting uh, those cytoplasmic inclusions that we also saw in the uh, smear. Again, no cross striations, no strap cells, no other features of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. So let's, uh, looking at the clinical picture, the imaging findings, and the cytomorphology, let's start stacking up our differentials. So in an older patient with uh, such sort of a clinical history and the cytomorphology, I think poorly differentiated carcinoma should always be on the top of the differential, especially a sarcomatoid uh, carcinoma. Malignant melanoma, the great mimicker, uh, can look like this, uh, can have plasma cytoid cells, eccentric nucleus, and some of them can actually show these uh, cytoplasmic inclusions. Lymphoma, uh, especially the large B cell lymphoma, such as DLBCL or anaplastic large cell lymphoma, is also a good differential. I did not see the wreath like nuclei that you usually see in anaplastic large cell lymphoma. <coughs> Finally, going to the uh, sarcoma realm, the differential is huge. Uh, the closest would be an epithelioid sarcoma, especially the proximal type, which can involve the uh, trunk. Uh, the other differentials are epithelioid angiosarcoma, epithelioid leomyosarcoma. Although in a leomyosarcoma, you might see some spindle cells in the smear or the cell block. And uh, towards the end of our differentials will be the adult rhabdomyosarcoma. So there is a pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, which uh, comes under the WHO classification. But again, as the name implies, it will be more pleomorphic. And then finally, a new entity that is epithelial rhabdomyosarcoma was very low in our differential, but it has been recently described. So that's, that's a clue to what the final diagnosis will be. <laughs> so um, we had a cell block, and uh, we decided to do some immunohistochemistry staining. And as you know, cell block material can be limited, especially when you have a histology lab that cuts to the block in the name of trimming. So we decided to do um, I'm sure you all know the pain of that. So we decided to do a limited immunohistochemistry panel. So we did Desmin, uh, we did S100 and SOX10, and uh, MyoD1, and an INI expression. So these large epithelioid cells were strongly positive and diffusely positive for uh, Desmin. They were negative for S100, SOX10, and uh, surprisingly negative for MyoD1. So with the positivity with Desmin, 
we ruled out a couple of uh, differentials. We ruled out a poorly differentiated carcinoma, um, a lymphoma, uh, an epithelioid um, sarcoma, and an epithelioid angiosarcoma is not, no longer in our differential. It was negative for S100 and SOX10, so that rules out uh, an epi uh, a malignant melanoma and uh, an MPNST with rhabdoid differentiation, the uh, malignant treton tumor, which is also in one of the differentials. INA expression was preserved in this tumor cells, so that rules out the epithelial sarcoma, which usually shows loss of INI1, and an extrarenal rhabdoid tumor, which can also uh, have loss of INI expression. So with this, we come to the final diagnosis. Uh, this is my son again. As you can see, he loves frogs. He did discover that there's a fount uh, fountain of water that comes out from the frog's mouth, and that gets activated every time he puts his hand on those eyes. So coming to the final diagnosis, uh, the, we, we signed it out as uh, consistent with uh, metastatic malignant rhabdomyosarcoma, and the top differential that we offered was an epithelioid rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a very newly described entity. It fits the clinical picture of an older aged male with rapidly progressive disease and widespread metastasis to lung, pleura, and lymph nodes. Uh, a subsequent inguinal lymph node biopsy was done, which showed similar morphology. Again, the same monotonous epithelioid cells and uh, the same immunophenotype, desmin positive, but it did show some patchy uh, myoD1 and myogenin staining. So what is this epithelioid uh, rhabdomyosarcoma? It's a recently described morphologically distinct variant of rhabdomyosarcoma. It is, in fact, a very close mimicker of a carcinoma or melanoma. It does not mimic that much of a sarcoma as it is a more of a differential for a carcinoma or melanoma. It does not fit into the current rhabdomyosarcoma classification. So uh, as you remember, the WHO has four uh, entities under the rhabdomyosarcoma. It's embryonal and alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, which is more common in younger patients. Pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, which was in our differential, which uh, happens in more adult patients, and then a spinal cell or sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma, which can happen both in the young and in the adult group, but has a different morphology, spinal or sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma. So this was the seminal paper which, was, uh, which described this epithelioid rhabdomyosarcoma. It was by Joe and uh, Fletcher in 2011, where they examined the 16 cases with uh, epithelioid rhabdomyosarcoma, and they were the first to describe it and formally designate it as an epithelial rhabdomyosarcoma. And after that, a handful of cases have come uh, across. About 30 cases are there in, uh, I did a review of literature and that's, that's all I could get. So they usually uh, affect males in their fifth to sixth decade of life. Somatic soft tissues of the extremities, head, uh, neck, and the trunk uh, is more common. They present as rapidly enlarging, often painful masses, and they have an aggressive clinical course and very poor prognosis. The uh, poor prognosis might be related to that they are often misdiagnosed as a poorly differentiated carcinoma and never put on sarcoma chemotherapy protocols. Uh, but anyways, they have a poor prognosis, and that's what happened to our patient. He died within a few days of uh, making the diagnosis. He could not put on a chemotherapy. He was uh, in a terminal stage. So cytology is challenging, and uh, it often recapitulates the histology. So histologically, you see these painful infiltrative masses, and they are made up of a monotonous sheet-like uh, growth of epithelioid cells with abundant granular cytoplasm, eccentric nucleus with a prominent nucleolus, and that's why very reminiscent of a melanoma or a carcinoma. Some of those cells can have rhabdoid cytoplasmic inclusions, as in, in our case, and even the biopsy that we got. Uh, immunophenotypically, they should show a skeletal muscle uh, immunophenotype, but that's not how it is in the real world. Uh, Desmin uh, has been reported to be diffusely positive, but again, they can have patchy myoD1 or even negative uh, myoD1 or myogenin, which are skeletal muscle markers. So uh, this is what I learned from this case, uh, that diagnosis and cytology of such tumors is really uh, hard. Uh, and uh, Part of it is because it's such a close mimicker of poorly differentiated carcinoma, and uh, it's very, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, diagnose this. It m should have a skeletal muscle phenotype, as we uh, saw, but it can show patchy or negative staining for those skeletal muscle markers. Some reports have also said that 
uh, they can have some patchy staining for cytokeratins, uh, such as A1A3, CAM 5.2, and EMA. Again, uh, confounding uh, results. So I want to thank my um, staff pathologist, Dr. Stone, who made this awesome diagnosis on cytology much before we got the inguinal lymph node biopsy. And uh, Shannon, who is my co-resident, who, uh, who helped me with this uh, entity, and we are in the process of writing it up. And this is Detroit, not yet frozen. Um, so I'm very thankful. Thank you so much. Dr. Dutta, thank you for that interesting case. Um, it amazes me that uh, I think, you know, people don't realize how fantastic the field of cytology is, that uh, it's not all about pap smears, as all of us know, right? You have to keep up to date with the literature, and we have to know, you know, all types of diseases in all parts of the body in order to, you know, make such a diagnosis. So I commend you and your team. But I am going to ask the jury to try and, uh, you know, Pick you apart. <laughs> <laughs> we won't do that, don't worry. Like when she's well done for presenting such a rare uh, case. Um, and I would like to ask you in what other way cytology could have been used? Obviously, it was used on a pleural fluid uh, to, to arrive at the diagnosis. Um, thank you for that question. I uh, did think about it. They, we could have done an FNA on the inguinal lymph node for sure. Um, I think at that point, the patient was very sick. He was almost uh, not, you know, like uh, acutely ill with that shortness of breath. So that pleural fluid was actually a therapeutic procedure, and that's how it came to us. Uh, and they tried to do a lung, node, uh, lung biopsy as well, since he had those multiple pleural and pulmonary nodules, but they, he was so sick, they could not do it. So, yeah, we could have done an FNA on the inguinal lymph node, but um, I and guess what was the not. turning point in uh, the diagnosis uh, morphologically on the pleural fluid? At what point did the sort of penny drop that this could be this incredible rare entity? So um, I think Dr. Stone, he saw those rhabdoid cells and we looked at it together and uh, did not, they were very monotonous. They were all uniform, did not see any pleomorphism. So he showed it to a couple of uh, colleagues um, in, at Henry Ford Hospital, and they all said, oh, this must be a poorly differentiated carcinoma, sarcomatoid type, and you know, let's just sign it out like that. And uh, somehow, I don't know, he just clicked for him. He said, like, let's do Desmond. Let's see like, what, what comes up. And then it lighted up uh, with Desmond, and that's when sometimes you know, the gut feeling of a cytopathologist, that, that helps, you know, experience, yeah. yeah yes. he's, uh, he's awesome. So that's what, uh, that's what uh, I, I did ask him about this, like how did you come to this diagnosis? It's yes. a rare entity, very recently described, handful of cases. How do you get to this diagnosis? So that's what he said. I just did Desmond out of my gut feeling that looks very rhabdoidy, those cytoplasmic inclusions. Let's do it and see what happens. And uh, that's how we came to the diagnosis. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, I'll, I'll just say that he might have also read a recent case report by our, our friend Andy Renshaw, who published this in a plural effusion just earlier this year. Oh. I had the opportunity to come across that when I had, you know, a really poorly differentiated plural fluid, and your case had a mass and other history, but, you know, I, I guess uh, I, I really thought, thought about thinking about this uh, entity because, uh, when you have a keratin neg negative, pretty monotonous, but mm -hmm. uh, poorly differentiated where the carcinoma melanoma differential exists as a primary presentation. So, uh, you know, I, I'll say I think, you know, case reports and small series are so very important in enlightening us and sharing them so that we can actually think of these incredible entities. And a shout out to Vicky Jo, who published the first series. She's yes. here too. So oh. thank you, Vicky. And uh, keep publishing those rare cases so we can all learn about them and make these diagnoses. And thank you, Jita. Thank you. Thank you so much. So at this point, um, you, as a jury member, please take out your cell phones and uh, text rare shirt 967 that's not any bad site, to 22333. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, Gulise to come up and entertain you with some quiz questions. <laughs> well, did you like that? Yeah, so let's give a round of applause for all these five Have wonderful you. people. Well, 
as far as I'm concerned, they're all winners. They all did a very, very nice job. But we said and we promised that we were actually going to find one winner. Therefore, while the jury and uh, our uh, Ryan Seacrest work on those numbers, uh, let me quiz you on a couple of things. And I'm not going to do any um, um, voting here just because I want you to vote on the uh, contestants. But I'm going to show you uh, some of these ASC trivia and see if you know it or not. All right, ready for the first question. Which of the following is not a previous name of the American Society of Cytopathology? This is not a nice board question because it has the word not in it. However, I do want you to know <laughs> what are these, uh, what was the previous name? So, A, American Society of Cytology, B, Inter-Society Council, Cytology Council, and C, College of American Cytologists. Anyone for A? Anyone for B? Anyone for C? All right. All right, correct. We never had the uh, name College of American Cytologists. As you know, it's CAP, College of American Pathologists. But the previous names of American Society of Cytopathology was indeed American Society of Cytology and the Inter-Society Council of uh, Cytology Council. Who was the first president of this society? The first president of this society Joe Meigs, George Paponicola, Alexander Meisels, and Warren Lang. All right. Who says A? Kind of hard to see you guys all from this light, but who says B? Any Bs? Any Cs? Alexander Meisels? This is a tough question, isn't it? Any Ds? Warren Lang. All right, a couple of Ds there. Well, wouldn't you know? Turned out the first president of the society, of course, was a male, and his name was Joe Meigs. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Furthermore, he was actually a gynecologist in Harvard University. He actually wasn't a pathologist. However, he did have the great insight to work with Miss Ruth Graham, who's one of the uh, pioneers of cytology, and they had a very nice paper the value of uh, uh, vaginal smear. So that was one of the beginnings. So he was indeed the uh, first president. Well, now that I did that, who was the first female president of the ASC? All right? Let's not make it sexist. Let's make it equal. <laughs> um, yeah, gender gap. All right. Uh, so A, Dr. King. B, Dr. Bibo, and she's here. And C, Dr. Saigo. And D, Dr. Solomon. All right, who says Dr. King? Any Dr. Kings? No Dr. Kings? A couple of Dr. Kings over there, all right. Uh, Dr. Bebo. Any Dr. Bebos? Okay, there's a couple of Dr. Bebos. Dr. Saigo, Patricia Saigo. Any Dr. Saigos? No? Okay. Any Dr. Solomons? D. Okay. All right, good. That's a good, very good educational point then. Actually, it turns out it's Dr. Eileen King uh, in 1977. So was first founded in the, the society was founded in the 1950s and it wasn't until 1977 where the first female president came in. Turns out of the 68 presidents, only 16 of them are uh, female. Just <laughs> trivia, <laughs> if you needed to know. All right, next question is, where and when was the first meeting of this society? Where and when? Salt Lake City, 2019. My first meeting was in uh, 2002 in Salt Lake City, actually. So first meeting, A, Baltimore in 59, Memphis in 61, New York City in 62, and Philadelphia in 53. Who says A? Any A's? Any B's? Memphis. Who says New York in 62? Who says Philly in 53? There's a couple of Phillies, all right, okay. It is indeed Philadelphia in 1953 It was the first meeting. The last question I have with a drum roll is, who of the listed below was the first female author of a cytopathology book? And the answers are Ruth Graham, Dr. Bibo, Dr. Koproska, and Dr. Coleman. Who says A? Any A's? Any B's? Dr. Bibo, there's a couple of Dr. Bibos over there. Dr. Bibo, you have some followers if you're in the audience. Uh, who says C, Dr. Koproska? Okay, maybe a couple there. And who says Dulce Coleman? Also a very well-known person. All right, okay, well, drum roll. 
Turns out, I did give you a tip earlier on, it's actually uh, Dr. or Mrs. Ruth Graham, who was a cytotechnologist, and that's the first book written in the 1950s, but notice she doesn't have her name on the cover like normal authors do, because she was a woman, and it was published in the 1950s, and I actually didn't know of this book until I read my mentor, Dr. Barney Naylor's paper, A Century of Cytopathologists, who was, of course, the president of the society at some point, and he talks about this very nice book and beautiful illustrations and that Ruth Graham wrote about this. So now you know, one of the important books in cytology was written by Ruth Graham. So how are we doing, okay. Ryan? So Ryan Seacrest is back. <laughs> um, everyone was excellent, everyone was a winner. And, uh, you know, I know that the jury struggled. I'm sure you struggled. Um, I, before I tell you who won the award, uh, I, the, yeah, <laughs> we'll have a quick break for commercial. Um, you know, if we could all just pause for a minute to see how fantastic cytopathology is, that no matter which part of the globe you're practicing in, what kind of health system you have, national health care or not, um, you know, and uh, when a patient walks through that door, as a cytology team, we're able to assist in managing and sometimes change the lives for those patients. So I think that's really phenomenal. And thank you to all of you traveling here to share that message. And also for junior people in the field to give us such fantastic take-home messages that you've taken at this point in your career. I hope you'll always come back to the ASC and continue to share your experience and knowledge. So uh, the winner is uh, our finalist, Elena Viglier. Congratulations. Come on up. You want to give the award. <laughs> Thank you. Come on forward. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, you get a plaque. All right. Okay. All right. In the light. In the light. I want to stay not the way. Thank you very much. And you also get a check as the winner. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very nice job. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you had a good time. Please put that on your evaluations. <laughs> thanks for our uh, finalists, and thanks for the jury, and thanks for Laurent Pantonovic. Yeah. Very nice yeah. job. Thank you. Bye. Can you guys come up on the stage? Okay, so we, they want to take a quick photo.